we will not stop until the last drug lord, the last financer, and the last pusher have surrendered. Kapag aki at mamaya maya, naliligo ako. Sabi ng kapitbahay namin, Celia, anak mo, patay na ano? Malayo pa lang ako. Paa pa lang ng asawa ko nakikita ko. Alam ko na. I'm John Avalon, Editor-in-Chief of the Daily Beast, and it is my honor to have a conversation with an extraordinary, courageous, and talented journalist, Patricia Evangelista from the Philippines. Thank you for having me. Patricia, your work is inspiring, your prose is extraordinary, but before we get into the human cost of the drug war, I want folks to get a deeper sense of who President Duterte is, how he governs, um, and, and the threat he may represent. Well, in the beginning, uh, President Duterte was a mayor of a city south of the Philippines. And uh, I suppose it would be easy to describe him when he was campaigning as something of a man's man. He liked motorcycles. He liked guns. He liked what he called the weaker sex, particularly the pretty ones. He would kiss them during his campaigns, lips to lips, because he said that way was delicious. He said quite a number of things that other politicians never said before. He said that he was a killer, that he had pushed a man out of a helicopter and was willing to do it again, that he killed when he was angry and he had killed more than a thousand, and that he wandered his street, the streets of his city looking for criminals to kill as an example to his policemen. And then he said that if he won, he would kill 100,000 criminals, that the fishes in Manila Bay would grow fat with the corpses of criminals. And then he said morticians would grow rich with the deluge of dead. So the people thought he was bold and brave and exactly what he, they needed. He said change was coming. So on the day he was inaugurated, he stood on a stage before some of the poorest of the Philippines, and he said, I am telling you now, do not go into drugs, because I will kill you. It may not be tonight, it may not be tomorrow, but in six years you will make a mistake, and I will go after you. And of course, after that, he said that if you know of any addicts, maybe you should kill them yourself, because it would be a kindness to their parents. And, and what is the death toll in the wake of this self-declared war on drugs today? Officially, there are 4,075 killed by the police. The narrative is that each one of these drug suspects fought back in perhaps raids, in search warrants, all of these things. So the police killed them in self-defense is the yes, official line. Yes, the argument is self-defense. But as you've seen from the pictures earlier, these are not all police killings. In the beginning, we call them vigilante killings, sometimes extrajudicial killings. The police call them deaths under investigation. There may be 16,000 deaths under investigation, according to the police. And um, generally, the narrative is the same. The, the suspect, the man, will be shot by drive-by motorcycles, or his body will be thrown down the street, already dead. And in some of the worst cases, in some of the photos you've seen, uh, his hands will be bound, his ankles will be bound, his face will be wrapped by the sort of packing tape you use to pack boxes. And then there will be a sign beside the body that says drug dealer. In the worst case that we've heard, um, there was a body. The particulars were the same. The body was on the ground. The sign was beside the body. He was bound, fists and ankles. And then when the police flipped the body over because he was face down, Somebody had picked up the same marking pen that they used to draw on the sign to say that he was an addict and drew on his face, eyes, nose, and a smiling mouth. Uh, Manila is uh, where murder has become a meme. Murder has become a meme. Yes. 
So in your reporting, what are, what's the context of this drug on war? Is Philippines' drug problem greater than other countries? And what's the cultural impact uh, of, of this spate of vigilante and police murders? In truth, from some accounts, the Philippines has roughly half the global, global average when it comes to drug use. Mm. But the president says the numbers are much higher. He, the numbers changed, 3 million, 3.7 million, 4 million. Then the president fired the head of the Dangerous Drugs Board for giving a much lower number uh, because he contradicted the government. And the president also doesn't delineate between a drug addict, a drug user, someone who used marijuana once in the last 13 months, or someone who was openly selling drugs. He says that anyone who has used meth and continually uses meth is beyond rehabilitation. It's not a health problem. He is beyond rehabilitation because his brain has shrunken so much that he is unable to be rehabilitated and he will beat his father and sell his children and will be useless to society. So these are the idiots, and I quote, destroying his country. And so murder is the utilitarian response for society. The president says kill them all. Kill them all. He is specific on which of his citizens he would prefer killed. These are the drug dealers, the drug addicts, the people he has demonized. However, he also says that these killings are not state-sponsored, that they are not violating human rights, and that in all probability, these are just drug cartels killing each other. And yet he remains extraordinarily popular as a president. Yes, he is. How does that corrupt the culture of the society? How does that define deviancy down? Well, it is, I think this is going to last long after he is no longer president. Because when, when the international community was arguing the possibility that the country or the president has committed crimes against humanity, the president said, frankly, are they human? Frankly, so, are they human? Yes. And on the worst day of the drug war, 32 people will kill, were killed by the police in a single city in a single night. And the next morning, the president said, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. And that if more people were killed in that fashion, then perhaps the drug scourge would end. When you're reporting these stories, um, I mean, it, going into these communities, the terror that must be imbued, how do you keep your courage up? How do you convince people to tell their stories? Or are they, in fact, afraid to tell their stories? The risks that the people who tell their stories take are enormous. We only go there, we talk to them, we tell their story, but the risks they take, they could be dead the next day. Their fathers, their sisters, their sons, they could be the next one on the list because there's a watch list that is largely informal, but these are the people who are allegedly drug suspects. So the terror in the urban communities, in the poorest areas, is, is, is really terrible. And the drug war does not extend to where I live, for example. I live in Quezon City. The death count is very high, but people do not die where I live. They die in shanty towns. They die in the second floor bedrooms of a place called Bagbag, where 13 people were killed by the police. So the drug war does not extend where privilege is. And, and that's important because that's one of the reasons it's difficult to actually get the true tally, because disasters are taken advantage of in some cases. The death toll is unaccountable because many of the victims are poor in this drug war. That is possible. Tell the story of Christine, because this is an extraordinary journalist and an incredibly gifted pro stylist, and the story of Christine is powerful, and we're gonna have some photographs. I guess I'll start with the once upon a time, which is the only good and proper way to begin a story. Once upon a time, there were six little children living in a cinder block house in a small village called Payatas in Quezon City. One day, Papa went, so Mama was staying, and then the police came, and they were looking for Papa, except he wasn't home. So they arrested Mama instead, and she was nine months pregnant and very afraid, but she went anyway. So when Papa came home looking for his wife, they told him to leave, never to come back, because the police might come and take him instead. So he left. He didn't come back for months. Then one morning, Christine, who is 12, the second, she woke up to see Papa at the stove making spaghetti because it was one of the birthdays of the little girls. 
And then he fed them, and then he sang to them, and then he told them to take care of each other because Papa would have to go. Then all of a sudden, there was shouting outside and the barrels of three guns through the window. And the police kicked the door open, and they shoved Papa on the couch, head down, a hand at the back of his neck, his knees to the cushion, and the children were crying, and Papa was saying, arrest me instead because my children are so young. So the police said, get the children out. And all of them went, crying, screaming, except for one, Christine, 12 years old, who threw herself on top of her father. The police grabbed her by the arm, threw her against the wall, said, get out, except she didn't get out fast enough. She said she was there when they shot her father in the back of her, his head. They shot him once, shot him twice, shot him so close that the next morning, her little brother stuck a finger through the couch and pulled out the bullet. And it was many months before Christine started talking again. She said she was sorry. She told her siblings she was sorry. She told her grandmother she was sorry. She said sorry because it was her fault. That had she held onto her father tighter, that had she hugged him harder, her father would still be alive. Had she hugged him harder. Of course, in the police report, it said that her father, Crisanto de Juan, a scavenger, had fought back against police and was one of three armed scavengers fighting against policemen. There were 30 armed cops, one police inspector, and three scavengers. The three scavengers died. None of the police were injured. None of the police were injured. And was anyone charged in this killing or any other? No, not in this killing. They operate with virtual impunity. And what about the children? What about the family? Their grandmother is raising the children. As I said, the mother was nine months pregnant. So now there are seven children living in a cinder block house in Payatas village, being raised by an old grandmother who does not know how to keep them alive. It's just a, a cascading series of horrors. And, and keeping Christine in mind, that must motivate you. As a journalist, when you're going into these dark areas and telling these dangerous stories, what's the attack on the media, on the press that Duterte has efforted as well? Um, the president is very sensitive to criticism. The government is sensitive to criticism. Those of us who cover those stories are told we are not patriots, that we are fake news. <laughs> the government has repeatedly attacked the media publicly. The president himself has said Rappler is fake news, is foreign owned, and is controlled by our imperialist lords. You guys in this room. And the, the Rappler, we should say, is the website, the yes. extraordinary investigative website you work for. Rappler has been accused of being CIA owned. Our license to operate has been suspended. We are in court. Our reporters are no longer allowed to cover the president. We have been charged with cyber libel. We have been accused of tax evasion and foreign ownership. We are not foreign owned. We do not evade our taxes. And we are not fake news. But there you have it. The accusations of fake news, the threats of legal violence to shutter speech, and also the president has come up with justifications for killing journalists at times. Is that right? The Philippines is one of the most dangerous places for journalists. But under this government, it's not necessary to kill a journalist. You have to simply destroy their integrity. However, he did say once that um, the fact that we are journalists does not mean we are not legitimate targets of assassination. Do you get that? The fact that we are journalists does not mean that we are not legitimate targets. Yes, I thought it was the fact I was human that <laughs> meant I was not a legitimate target of assassination. <laughs> but I'd like to emphasize that I'm not the only reporter covering the night shift. There are many of us. And I'm not the only reporter covering the president. And in fact, a lot of the reporters for Rappler have been threatened with rape, with murder, with many things daily, and are still reporting, and across the country. And, and the threat of rape, 
is something that has been sanctioned by this president in some context in a way that is so horrific that I think it bears repeating in the context of soldiers and in his own uh, statement he made uh, about a prison riot. Well, during his campaign, he, he gave a lot of speeches in a lot of places, and he spoke about the 1989 riot in some prison in Davao City where he was mayor. And he said that uh, he was there when the riot was over and that a young missionary had been killed, a woman. And he said he looked down at the body and he thought, she's beautiful. She looks like a beautiful American. And he said he was angry. Maybe he was angry at the rape, but mostly he was angry because he got there too late. Because the mayor should have been first. And he has also said that soldiers, that if they rape once or twice, that's acceptable. But if it's more than that, then the maybe there's a problem. The third time is a problem. It, it, is, it is a horrific caricature, but a reality you are living every day. And what I think is troubling is his popularity at a time when we see the rise of this sort of you know, autocratic populism. And what are the, the warning signs? Why do you think this is taking hold in a country with a a tradition of democracy that has been distorted? I don't know. The president has an enormous satisfaction rating. He is much loved by the people. It's not so much, we, you're right, we do have a tradition of human rights, of democracy. It's not so much we don't understand human rights. It's because one day we all decided, or the president did, that some people weren't human. And that has proven popular. Yes. What's the hope you hold on to as a journalist, as a citizen, to push back on that tide? Because it must seem very bleak. He's got another four years in office, right? I don't think, I don't think I'm the resistance, or journalists are. We're journalists. We're there to tell the story. And I don't think a single story I write has stopped one person being killed. And I need to understand that at this point, nothing is unimaginable. That what we thought was impossible is happening every day, brutalizing families. Because you kill one guy, his whole family is broken. Look at Christine. And across the whole country, widows, young women, all of them left behind. They don't just have to break their hearts over a dead husband or a father. The moment a person is killed, they have to worry about burying the body because we're Catholic. So there are bodies in living rooms that they can't bury because they can't afford to. And then they have to raise children. And then they have to worry about the future. And these kids are the same kids like Christine who are spat at because their fathers are drug addicts and it was their fault because they deserve to die. So I'm not sure about hope, but I believe in journalism. And I believe that if we tell the stories, at least we acknowledge that these are people. And we try our damnedest to make people imagine that these are people, not 4,075 or 16,000 or whatever numbers will come out. These are people. His name was Crisanto de Juan. He was a father. He may have been a user. He may not have been, but he was human. And by telling those stories. <laughs> journalism matters especially against those kind of odds. And thank you for your courageous work. And this too shall pass if we tell stories like that of Christine. Patricia Evangelista, thank you so much.